I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be here to gather together, Lord, to worship, to pray, to give you thanks, Lord, for providing us this day, for providing us the fellowship with one another, Lord. We ask that you bless the hearing of this word this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, last month we discussed the importance of biblical harmony. Uh, today I'd like to continue that thought and actually look at some examples of some doctrines that we could not fully and correctly understand until the proper time. So I'd like to begin by looking at Luke chapter 18. Uh, we'll take a look at Luke 18 verse 31 so we can establish a very important biblical principle regarding this part of the study. Luke 18, 31, we'll read down to verse 33. Luke 18, 31. There we read. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and he shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and on the third day he shall rise again. Now, by a show of hands, how many people have a hard time understanding what read here? We're well, let's take a look at the next verse. Verse 34. They understood, and they, meaning the disciples, understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So a passage that we can now look at and pretty clearly understand was at one point in time not able to be understood until God opened up the understanding of his people. And in the case of this passage, understanding these words didn't come until after Christ rose from the dead. Let's take a look, to, uh, take a look at Luke chapter 24. Chapter 24, we'll read verse 44. Uh, I guess we can read down to verse 46 as well. In Luke 24, verse 44, we read, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all the things might be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning you. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. In other words, the opening up of understanding of God's people to any part of the scriptures has been reserved for specific times. This is a very important Bible study principle, and it's something that God has done throughout the history of the world, including the time of the end. Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. There we read. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. It says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And then we can skip down to verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, O Jehovah, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Okay, so God is pretty clearly telling us that information was reserved to be unsealed at the time of the end. Okay? Scripture was sealed. It was not able to be understood until the time of the end. I remember some time ago, before May 21, I was driving in my truck. I was listening to family radio when Mr. Camping had made the announcement on the air for the first time about how Christ did not make payment for sins at the cross 
before the foundations of the world. And I remember as soon as I heard those words, I began shaking my head. It's like, poor guy, you know, he finally lost it. Our whole life, you know, we understood when Christ made payment for sins. And yet today, I'm grateful that I've been able to see and teach that very same truth. Uh, this, of course, is only possible because of what we read in Daniel chapter 12. That God had opened up the scriptures in the time of the end so that only his people would be able to understand. Um, we, we understand doctrines that now we can see were an error in the past. Uh, one of them would be the doctrine of hell. Uh, but before we get into that subject, I want to point on something out that we talked about last month regarding the importance of biblical harmony. When people read the Bible and arrive at doctrines by segmenting portions of the scriptures, then what they're doing is they're not being faithful to the method that God has laid out for arriving at truth. Um, so the only way that such doctrines that they hold can exist is because harmony is given no consideration. All right, let's get into the doctrine of hell. Um, let's take a look at Romans chapter 6, 23. Uh, what I want to look at first is what we're learning, what we've learned as far as the law that God has established for what the penalty of sin must be. In Romans chapter 6, 23, we read, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now the word wages means payment. Death is the payment the law of God required for sin. And we read of this first law, of this law first being given to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, 16. Genesis 2, 16, we read. And Jehovah God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So Adam and Eve sinned the very day they disobeyed God. According to the, according to the law that God had laid down, that very same day they died. But they didn't die physically. No, their soul died. Okay, so understanding the condition of the soul in the life of the sinner or in the life of the unsaved is or should be very important to understanding the doctrine of hell. This is something that wasn't understood by us in times past. We believe that the wages of sin was an eternity in a place called hell. But just as we read in the example of Luke 18, understanding was hid from them until the time appointed just as it was also done unto us. Okay? We were not allowed to understand what was being said until the time appointed. Before that, we thought that the souls of the unsaved lived forever and suffered in a place called hell. But now, we understand that the soul of the unsaved that dies, the person that dies and saved, is dead. Okay? Now we understand that when Adam and Eve sinned, they did indeed die, but they died spiritually. That means their soul died. So how do we know that their soul died? Well, one reason is because they still physically remained alive for many years after they sinned. God said, for in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Okay? And the second is because the Bible tells us that the soul that sins shall die. Okay? Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18 verse 4. There we read. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So the Bible tells us that the soul can and does indeed die. As a matter of fact, all who have ever been conceived of the seed of man have sinned, have been found guilty, and have been conceived with a dead soul. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, we read, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so, which means in this manner, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Because of Adam's sin, the penalty of death passed on to all of mankind. That's why the scriptures say that all have sinned. But how have they sinned? How has a, a, a child who has just been conceived said to have sinned? Well, it's because they were conceived by a corrupted seed. It's because they were conceived by the seed of man who fell into sin from the very beginning. Okay, that's why salvation from sin was possible even before birth. Let's take a look at Psalm 51 verse 5. There we can see the condition of mankind. Psalm 51 verse 5. There we read. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, take a look at Job chapter 14. Job chapter 14, verse 4. In Job chapter 14, verse 4, we read, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Okay, so God is telling us, you know, that the guilt of Adam's sin uh, and the punishment he suffered was passed on to all people, beginning at conception. In other words, everyone who has ever been conceived by the seed of man has sinned, and as a result, the law of Ezekiel, chapter 18, 4, that we previously read, which demands death for sin, or the soul that sins, applies to every human being. Let's take a look at Hebrews, chapter 9. Hebrews 9, verse 27. In Hebrews 9, 27, we read, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. This verse is focusing on the spiritual death that came upon all men. It's focusing on the death of the soul and not on the physical death. Now, how, can we, how can we be sure? Well, first of all, because not all men have died physically in the past, nor will all men be dead uh, at the very end. Now, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22 we read, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So what I want to focus on here is the first half of the verse, um, the part that speaks about uh, death says, for as in Adam, all die. This verse is telling us that all of mankind is in Adam. In other words, all of mankind comes from the seed of Adam. Okay, this would be the same as saying that because death by sin came upon Adam, it has also come upon all those who would come from him. That's mankind. And this is what Hebrews 9.27 is referring to. It's the spiritual death which is the death of the soul. This is the death that has been appointed for man to experience once. One time. Why one time? Because once the soul dies, it's dead. Okay? And the only way a dead soul could be revived, the only way it could be brought back to life, is if God took the sins which condemned that soul to death and placed them on Christ. Okay? condemning him to death on their behalf. And this, of course, God did on behalf of his elect. Uh, once the application of the saving work of Christ was applied to each individual, the soul which was dead, in essence, was brought back to life. Never again being able to die because of sin. Because this time, we have not been born again from a corruptible seed like Adam, but from an incorruptible seed by the word of God. We can read that in 1 
chapter 1. Let's take a look at that. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. There we read. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. See, the fact that a soul can be made alive, uh, as the second half of 1 Corinthians 15.22 declares, teaches us that the soul of man can and has indeed died in Adam. Okay? The soul of the unsaved, therefore, is not immortal. And that seriously impacts the doctrine of eternal suffering. Okay? Let's take a look at a warning given by Christ regarding the death of the body and the soul. Uh, let's take a look at that in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. There we read. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now the word kill is also translated as the word put to death. Notice that the body and the soul are said to be able to be killed or put to death. An emphasis on this verse is placed or places more value not on the killing of the body, but on the killing or on the death of the soul. Okay, also notice that the second half of this verse, the word kill has been replaced. It's been replaced with the word destroy. So why would I use uh, the word destroy here rather than the previous word he used for the word kill when describing what can be done to the body and the soul. Well, it's when both are killed, then that individual has perished. Okay, which is what the word destroy also means. Let's take a look at um, Jeremiah chapter 49 verse 7. Okay, as we look at the, uh, the scriptures, we come to understand that to perish means to be no more. It means to vanish. And uh, that's what we're going to read here in Jeremiah 49. Jeremiah 49, verse 7. There we read. Concerning Edom, thus saith Jehovah of hosts, is wisdom no more? In Teman, is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? So again, this can't be overemphasized. Okay, a person who dies physically, having a dead soul, ceases to exist. Now, those who believe in a literal place called hell also believe that the soul of the unsaved is immortal. Okay, after all, the Bible is on death, but it's the soul they say that lives on forever. Okay, and it's the soul that they for eternity. Okay, now there's many variations of the doctrines of hell out there. Some say that it's just the soul that suffers, the soul and the body suffer, but either way they look at it, the one thing they agree on is that the soul of the person who dies unsafe must be alive for eternity, okay, or uh, while in hell as well. Now they believe this because of the way they take segments from the scriptures and as individual truths without looking uh, throughout the whole Bible for harmony. Let's take a look at the account of the rich man of Lazarus, uh, found in Luke chapter 16. This account is believed to solidify the doctrine of uh, eternal torment of hell for those who believe in it. Uh, the majority are convinced that this is not a parable, but an actual literal event. Uh, therefore, they take this account literally and conclude that a person can conscious existence in a place called hell. Luke chapter 16, we'll read verses 19 through 31. Incidentally, they believe that this account is to be taken literally because Christ uh, used a, a personal name, okay, because he named Lazarus. And they, every time they read a parable, that Christ spoke, they say, well, look, nowhere else in the Bible did Christ use a, a person's name when he uh, spoke a parable. So because he used a person's name here, 
uh, this can't be a parable. Okay, that, in other words, that's proof enough for them to take this account literally. Uh, and usually it's because they make the mistake of thinking that the words in the Bible that are found that are in red are the only words of Christ. Okay, uh, and that's a mistake. We, know, we understand that the entire Bible uh, are the words of Christ. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at Luke chapter 16 to see which way the Bible directs us. Luke 16, we'll start at verse 19 and we'll read down to verse 31. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at the gate, at his gate, full of sorts, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, and being in torments he seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now, I know Chris has already done an in-depth studies uh, on this particular um, account, so I'm not going to do the same. Instead, what I want to look at are a few examples that will help us understand why uh, the Bible would not as a literal account. Remember, the Bible allows for it to be. 